Can you build a multiplayer game with zero knowledge? Surely you can, but if you don't fully understand it like myself back then, then be prepared for these. Hey, what's up? This is Ashra here, and in today's video, we're gonna learn some of the important concepts of multiplayer. Let's start by understanding these three terminologies: servers, clients, and host. Servers are computers that provide data or service to other computers, which are called as clients. So, what are clients? You guessed it, they're the computers that request and access data or service that is made available by a server. And what's a host? It's nothing but a computer that can run its own server and act as a client simultaneously. All right, now let's talk about multiplayer topologies. Generally, there are two types. The first one being dedicated game server. In this, there's a dedicated server and all the players are connected to it. The advantage is that it offers more processing power memory and storage capabilities. However, the downside to this is going to be the cost. Because you need to have a server running 24-7 and a backup server if that fails, having a dedicated server will be costly. The second type is going to be client hosted. In this, one player creates a server and all the other players are going to join that server. The advantage here is obviously going to be the cost since you don't need a dedicated server. And the disadvantage here is going to be that if the host happens to have a weaker computer or a bad internet, then the game is going to suffer from lags and crashes affecting all the players that are connected to it. So how do you decide if you want to have a dedicated server or a client hosted? Well, that depends on the type of game. If it's a slow paced casual game like poker or a game with low graphics like the older versions of Call of Duty, Client hosted is more than sufficient. Whereas for a fast paced games with high intensity and high graphics like Fortnite, a dedicated server is a must. All right, now let's talk about data transfer. So how exactly are the data transferred back and forth between the client and server? Well, that's done with the help of what's called a transport layer. The basic function of a transport layer is to accept the data from a computer, split it into smaller units if required, pass it through the network, and ensure that all the data arrives correctly at the other end. There are two main protocols for transferring data, TCP and UDP. TCP stands for Transmission Communication Protocol and UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. While TCP is more reliable and it sends data in the correct order and ensures that there is no data missing, UDP transfers the data much faster, but there's no guarantee that all the data will be received in the other end. And if it does, there's no guarantee that it will be receiving in the same order. Technically, two computers transfer data with each other with the help of a network IP, a protocol, and a port. You can think of this like sending a mail, where the IP address is your home address, a protocol is like choosing either a standard delivery or an express delivery, and a port is going to be your door number. A port number is associated with only one computer in the network. So if two of you are connected to the same Wi-Fi, then both of you will have the same network IP, but the port number is going to determine which computer the data has to be transferred to. Now, if you're wondering how to find out your network IP, then just Google my IP address. Also, if you're wondering how to find out what type of protocol is being used, well, that depends on the type of application. Let's assume you're building an application using Photon services, then by default, it uses UDP, but you can change it to TCP. However, if you're building an application that uses Unity's netcode for game object services, then you will have to specify which type of protocol you'd like to use. All right, now that we know how the data is being transferred, let's talk about latency, which in the context of games means the amount of time between a cause and its visual effect. In simpler terms, it's the time between you pressing an arrow key and you visually seeing the character move. For a single player, it's almost zero, but for a multiplayer, you can expect some latency. But why? Let's assume you're in New Zealand and you're connected to a server in Australia, which is approximately 4,000 kilometers or 2.5K miles away. Now, when you send the data, it has to pass through different routers and each router has to copy, inspect and reroute the data and this causes the delay. Let's assume the delay is 50 milliseconds. So when the player moves by pressing the arrow button, the input from the keyboard is sent to the server. Assuming the server does the calculations immediately and sends a new position back to the player, it would have taken a total of 100 milliseconds. So what does this mean? The player sees his character moves one tenth of a second later after pressing the arrow button, thereby perceiving lag due to the latency of data transfer. So can this be solved? Yes. But before that, you need to understand two concepts, server authoritative systems and client authoritative systems. In a server authoritative system, the server gets to make the final decision. 
The advantage is that it is secure from cheaters and maintains a consistent gameplay for all the clients that are connected. The downside is that there's a possibility of lag as the players need to wait for the confirmation from the server. In a client authoritative system, the client gets to make the final decision, which means that if a player moves, it moves the character immediately and sends the new position to the server, which it then updates for the other clients. This might not be a problem for a turn-based game like poker, but if it's a fast-paced shooter game, then it's difficult to maintain consistency. What I mean is, on your end, you might not see any lag, but for other players who are connected to the server, they see your past position and not the correct one. This leads to problems like getting shot even if you're hiding behind the wall. Also, this opens the door for cheaters. From this table, it's quite clear that we need a server authoritative system, but without lag. And this is where the concept of client prediction comes into picture. On a higher level, what you need to know is when a player presses an arrow key, the client predicts the outcome and moves the player immediately while it waits for the confirmation from the server. Once the server sends the response, it then compares the two results, which in most cases will match unless you're a cheater. And in such case, since the server has a final say, it snaps the player back into his actual position. Now, the client prediction comes with its own set of problems like synchronization issues, and there are solutions for that too, like server reconciliation. But these topics are for some other time. However, if you're interested, I will leave a link for them in the description. Now, the last concept that you'll need to know is the tick rate or simulation rate. The tick rate or simulation rate tells us how many times per second the server processes and returns the data. At the beginning of the tick, the server starts to process the data it receives and runs its simulation. Then, it sends the results to the client and sleeps until the next tick happens. The faster the server finishes the tick, the earlier the clients will receive the new data and that leads to a more responsive gameplay. If the tick is 60 Hz, it means that the server sends 60 updates per delta time. So why is this tick rate so important? Since every player is affected by a certain amount of latency, Depending upon the distance to the server, it will decide the tick rate for each client. This means the server will process the game state using time steps, regardless of how much actual time has passed, thereby maintaining a sync between all the players. Phew, that was a lot of information. I know some of these concepts might be hard to digest, but you will understand them better as you implement them. But for now, I'm sure that these concepts will help you get started with multiplayer networking. Alright, so that's it for this video. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe as well. And I will see you in the next one.